now I'll give you the nickel tour here of, <laughs> of Old Town. Um, this is probably the smallest Victorian structure in the state of California. That's the Tarpy Depot. And this was our original train station. These were all railroad tracks over here, so this is a big rail yard. Uh, this is where the lumber flume from Shaver Lake met the railroad. And that was the spark that created the city of Clovis. So we're pretty much dead center in that one square mile area. Okay. Here's our grammatically incorrect gateway to the Sierras sign. <laughs> Old Town was designed for pedestrians and horses. It wasn't designed for automobiles. The city's changed quite a bit. It was its own kind of industrial town at the turn of the century. It was a lumber town and an agricultural and ranching town. Post-World War II, you saw some development that was coming here, and it led to something of the deterioration of our Old Town in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It just didn't have the flash that newer automobile-oriented commercial centers had. And we saw a lot of the uh, kind of the stable businesses in our downtown move to other areas that were automotive-oriented. So when I got here in 1981, Old Town was depressed. It had about a 40% vacancy rate. And so Old Town began to sort of collapse and it just was not a very attractive place to do business. And so in 83, we began looking at plans going, how do we bring some authenticity and how do we bring people back to Old Town area? And so this is a result of the partnership between the city and private property owners and business owners going, let's all pull together and try to figure out how we do this. This is a relatively new fire station. We took the old Clovis Grammar School and we made it the center of the building. So these arches that you see reflect the old Clovis Grammar School. Centennial Plaza is a fairly recent plaza, so we have these now somewhat mixed use developments that are commercial first floor, office second floor. So all this is pretty much just in the last year or so. And, and it wasn't uh, this way in the 80s. Oh no, it was, everything was painted brown and beige, like that was the cheapest paint they could buy. And it just, on a day like this, it was just depressing. But what we found with our first plan was, we, we concentrated on the pedestrian environment of Old Town. But all of a sudden we started seeing concentric rings of vitalization in the residential areas. And that was kind of an unintended affect. You know, we really didn't think about that and didn't plan for it. But it turned out that people liked the Old Town area enough that they started revitalizing their homes because they wanted to live down here because it was real. And there were things that were happening. So these are kind of boutique -y little neighborhoods here. They're small little homes. You know, these probably go back to 1900 or so. You know, so here's where these homes are on the front of a 150 foot deep lot and they have alleys. Where you had really attractive homes on the front and a lot of garbage in the back. We did a specific plan update a couple years ago. One of the things we looked at was the alleys in Old Town. There are a lot of old lots. They're 50 feet wide, they're 150 feet deep. They have alleys on the back of them. And so you ended up with a really nice house out front, and then you ended up with a whole backyard and an alley full of junk cars and all the detritus of people's lives over the period of time. Yeah, so here's like a little alley that runs through there. That was not bad, but it could look a lot better with some units that are, that are facing onto it. So the idea came up, why don't we look at a program where we can encourage people to do second units on the alley. Second units are allowed by right in the state of California. And maybe by encouraging that, we could come up with building plans that could be plan checked already. You could hand them over to people, they could get a building permit and immediately get going with it. I think we have 11 building permits out right now. Seven buildings under construction. Here's one of our cottage homes. It's not exactly your tiny homes, but it's kind of a hybrid between an accessory unit and a tiny home. This is all one lot. The other home, I don't think the homeowner lives on the property. I think it's a rental unit, and they were interested in developing another rental unit with it. 
So in a sense, it would be two homes on one property. Yeah, state law says by right, anybody can build a second unit on their property. This one, it has an orientation toward the alley, so your front door, your front windows, face the alley. And we're thinking, get enough of these, and the alley becomes a pedestrian street, and you begin to develop a neighborhood down something like this. So you can see there's a little bit of a setback. They're required to have a landscaped area between the unit and the alley, so this, this will get greened up here. There's a parking space that will sit here where the, where the temporary John's at. The older parts of town had alleyways, and I think it was residual where you actually had the horse barn out back, or it was just the standard of subdivision at that time. Of course, post-World War II, you just didn't build alleys anymore because it was automobile-oriented. So in looking at this type of environment, again, you end up with alleys that are kind of utilitarian and not much in the way of residential. So the idea is to turn an alley into, let's say, part of a city, in the sense that instead of just having the trash cans, you just actually can have like a community going, right? How you make that happen? I think we look at it like any development, it has to make financial sense for somebody to do. Because we're not going to pay them to do that, but we could afford to have a set of plans done that 40 different property owners could use. That was our thinking, is if we spent $9,000 for a set of plans, multiply that by 30, and that's how many units you'll get out of it if you can give those plans free to people to utilize. This floor plan is about uh, 400 square feet of livable area. We're standing in what would be the, the living room right now. This wall here is an option. So the, the uh, bedroom sits back here. This could be a studio. There's also an option to have French doors. I could see why you might not want to have French doors on the alley. This is the kitchen area, refrigerator, stove, venting, and then this back room. This is the bathroom back here. I think this is the washer dryer back here. Yeah, here's, here's the plumbing. It's designed to be able to take a stackable washer dryer so it, you don't have to go to the laundromat. It, it's a complete dwelling unit. It's also designed, if you're back to back with another house, it's designed to give the other residents some privacy. So you might be able to have a little backyard back here combined with a fence separating you from somebody else's backyard. Yeah, but it's right, it's pretty fairly close to the neighbor. There's no oh, yeah. certain amount of setback from the house. Yeah, there, there's a minimum setback by code. I think you have to be four feet away from the other structure. So it's close, but it meets building standards. Uh, normally, if you were to do a second unit, you would come in and have a set of drawings prepared by a building designer or an architect. That would probably cost nine, ten thousand $10,000. You would then go to the building department and get a plan check. You'd have to get those plans plan checked specifically for that site. You're talking another couple thousand dollars to do that. There's no, it, the, the units are already plan checked, okay. so you don't have to get them plan checked. Okay. There's a cost involved with that. You don't have to get them designed. You know, we come out and we look at your property and make sure it fits, you know, that there's no sewer lines running under the site, that there's nothing that constrains the development, because we don't want to get somebody started on something they can't finish. So each property is kind of unique in Clovis. Um, we look at that. If it fits, you get your set of plans, get your building permit, and get going. And what's the typical rent then? What we're hearing, there's another one up the alley that plans to rent for 700 bucks a month. We've heard some other folks that would rent for maybe $900 a month. And so they're going to see a positive cash flow based on the rental. So they may go get a loan, but they're going to be able to pay off their debt service immediately. And we're thinking as other people see that, they may be interested in doing the same thing. The city, I think, wants to clean up the alleyways and have more affordable living downtown, Old Town. And I am gonna do that, but then at the same time, I'm gonna try to find somebody that might be able to help take care of my dad when he gets older. He lives, he lives right here, he lives next door. I thought it might be a good idea to maybe have somebody live there and eventually have to maybe look after him and... So like a caretaker cottage? Yeah. I was gonna put a garage here, you know, a covered garage for an RV, and then uh, when I went down to the city, a friend of mine who works there, Said something, said something to me about the program. So then I went home and I got thinking about it. I thought, you know, I, that's, a, that's a better idea than what I had. So then I met Maria and she got me started on the permits and away we go. So then your costs are? My costs would be like any other cost of building a house minus the plans 
And I think the permit fees were discounted, like sewer hookups and things like that. Th that that's were... that's the, one of the biggest savings is not having to do the separate lateral connections. Yeah. yeah. So that's what they're that, saving that's a big money cost. on as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think probably for the average house, you're looking at about nine or $10,000 for those fees. And I'm into it a thousand, even though we're pulling power from here. Okay. We can read how much energy this house uses. There'll be one of these on this panel over here. Just haven't gotten that far yet. And you didn't do any extra water metering or anything like that. It's all just from this main house. Correct. I'm just saving some money there. Plus the city gives you the plans for free if you live in their area. So it has to, be, has to back up to an alleyway. And this alleyway before, what, it, what was here? Was well, that I'm just assuming the alleyway went through. It did go through many years ago. It went through. And then when they quit using alleyways, they, they box that in over there and there's houses over there now. But the, this alleyway goes right to Maria's office. If you look right down the street, it goes right down to Maria's office. So here are the floor plans. Basically the floor plans are all uh, 400 square feet or less livable area. There's basically three different uh, floor plans that are available. Each floor plan has three de different elevations to it. These are all one bedroom or studios. They're kind of convertible either way. All of them are less than 400 square feet of internal livable area. So we looked at a couple of them saying, okay, this kind of represents the design of our housing stock. Clovis was a worker community. It was a lumber town back at the turn of the century. So you see a lot of these little kind of homes there already and thinking, well, maybe we can kind of pick up on that style. The architect came up with a couple plans that way. And then there was also a desire to look at doing a plan that had a garage below. And so this is our third plan. It actually has a two car garage underneath it. It's lifted up. I like it because it has kind of the outdoor patio, a little bit of a view into the neighborhood. What was interesting was working with a building designer. They had to meet code. They had to meet their Title 24 requirements and energy requirements and all of this. And we wanted to control the architecture a little bit from the standpoint, you get a free set of plans. You can't just build a stucco box. It has to have some architectural integration to it. It has to fit the neighborhood. They have three different plans and they have two or three different elevations. I was kind of pigeonholed into using this particular one because it's a rectangle. It fit on this property. I would have rather pick number one, but it's a square and the squares didn't work good here. So I had to pick a rectangle, which 16 by 31. And the plan one is 21 by 23. Yeah. So see, it's more of a square. Okay. This is the living room and kitchen. Uh, TV goes up there. But you can see I'm, I'm just I'm putting cabinets in right now. But yeah, this is, this is the, the living area, if you will. Yeah, so there's a, a stackable washer and dryer that goes in here. Uh, bathroom, a bedroom. And you can, you can get this model and have it a studio if you would like. So you would knock all that wall out right there and this would be one big room, which would, which would really open it up. If you do it this way, you have a closet space and you have like a linen closet right here. But you know, if you're a single person a college student, they would probably rather prefer the open floor plan. Have like a Murphy bed or a drop down bed. There's enough space in there for one person, possibly two, but that's it. That's a generous bathroom, huh? It is. Well, a good friend of mine's building one also not very far from here. Yeah. He has just a, a shower. So, so you were the people who were building these. I mean, you can, yes. And people like the idea. It's oh yeah. I mean, when you when you can put another dwelling on a piece of property that you already own, I mean, that's it's, it, it, you're crazy not to do it. Up the equity of my house, you know, of the property. It'd be different if I had to buy the land and everything, but I already own the land. You know, there was a big, there was a probably a hundred year old pomegranate tree right here. Huge. Almost cried taking it out. So then you were spending, do you have an idea what it's going to cost you? Oh, I can probably give you right down to a Oh, really? Can we go look? <laughs> so I'll be into about 57,000. Of materials. And right? labor. Including your labor. Okay. So you calculated yeah, your labor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you could rent this for what? If you were going to rent it? Any idea? Oh, I'm going to rent it. He, okay. He's good right now. So you'll rent it right away. Oh yeah. Okay. There's people come, if I'm here on a Saturday working, uh, there'll be 10, 15 people come by. And ask about renting. About renting it or, or building one. So you can see the eaves of the house, how close they are, see. Do you know how far you had to be from the main house? Four I feet? did know. It it's yeah. four or five feet. It was close, but it wasn't much of an issue. But, but, it, but it did make us use plan number two, though. What are rents like around here? What could you get? If I furnish it, which I'm going to fully furnish it. So probably 850. 850 a month. Mm -hmm. yeah. It'll take me about seven years to recoup my money. Not including the property value. 
So if I ever decide to sell both of them, you know, I'll get the equity in it. And, but I don't plan on selling them, so. This is where one of the cottage homes is. This is another one of the cottage homes over here. Mm -hmm. And then there's this is another one that's like around right here. This whole thing is Clovis. The whole thing's Clovis, yeah. So it's a very limited program right now. Yeah, right now it is. Yeah. So it's right here. The boundary of Old Town. So it would be like this. Old Town Clovis was the original square mile when the city was incorporated back in 1913, I think it was. And so our specific plan relates to the Old Town area. This is the area that has most of the alleys in it. So it's kind of an old style of development in our town. And this is what would be applicable in terms of the cottage program utilizing the alleys for development. So you've and had, in one square mile, 11 people so far. That's yeah, I think we're kind of surprised by the uptake from folks using it. So you know, this is an experiment. We're going, I don't know if this is going to work or not. And all of a sudden, we just started getting interest in permits. So what we did was, um, when we first brought the program out, I did a mass mailing. Okay. And we targeted every single property that we saw that could fit a cottage home. And um, after that, we, you know, we got all 100 plus lots that they'd be able to do a cottage home on. 300 plus just in this area? Just in this area. It's one square mile. Uh -huh. Yeah. And this one, he got his permits and within a month he had the whole building standing. So it's something that could be built pretty fast. We looked at other programs. We looked at some of the, like the, the tiny house programs. The city of Fresno, our big sister to the west, has a program. I don't know that they've done any yet. And so we were looking at it in terms of, so what's the value and how do you encourage people to do this? And it seemed like one of the things was if it's a movable shelter or a temporary shelter, it may be of interest to somebody that wants to live in one, but it may not be interest of a property owner that would want to have one on their property. And so we kind of approached it a little bit differently going, well, how can we encourage property owners to come in and do this and yet provide small living spaces in a small urban environment that would be attractive and usable. This is actually our specific plan. This is our, our Central Clovis specific plan. And it was to try to build on the success of where we were at over the last 30 years with Old Town. And this is the page that deals with the at that time, we called it pedestrian residential. We didn't know exactly what we were going to call this program or mm -hmm. what we were going to do. But I think this visual kind of gives you an idea of how an alley could look. And we kind of put it in there going, hey, if you got a house on an alley, it doesn't have to just be full of trash cans and power lines. I think density is part of it. These lots are about 6,000 square feet, so you get about four units per acre. What happens now is that we've increased it potentially to eight dwelling units per acre by including second units. So you had the area to do it, you had people that would, would receive some financial gain by doing it, you have people that want to live in Old Town, and here's the opportunity to be able to do that. So, so planning can make a difference. I mean, it sounds like that's what, kind of what you're trying oh to do. Oh yeah, really and if you have a city council that will stick to their plans, that's a huge difference. And it may happen in 30 years, but we understand that's what it takes to be able to do that.